Hello friend, I have a story to tell you today. It's the story of my daughter's life. She died of lung cancer at the age of 39. And I have written a book, a book which I think is helpful to us today in the very difficult circumstances in which we live. It brings hope and encouragement and a sense that all is well. I hope you enjoy it. Episode 11 is called Thoughts. My thoughts and then Shirley's thoughts. We begin with my thoughts. While Brian is away for a week in September 1997, God blesses me in a special way. Every night I encounter the Holy Spirit. As he falls upon me, I find myself lying on the carpet. Gently he pours himself into me so that by the end of the week I am blessed beyond measure. For a start, from now on, coming face to face with Christ becomes part of my life. I so want Shirley to have this too. I want this so much for her that I pray, whatever it takes, Lord, more than once. If you have a belly button, you have baggage, a wise friend said recently. My own baggage skews my understanding. At times I'm over anxious and push too hard. God knows with what other unhelpful baggage I clutter our relationship. As we do life, I find out not only how broken Shirley is, but also how broken I am. It seems she suffers from an anxiety disorder and dependency and probably clinical depression as well. I don't know what it is. Her problem makes sure that she sees life askew. I know there's no fix but I refuse to see her challenges as beyond fixing. Often before we talk, I pray, come and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Show me how to help Shoals, dear God. I don't know how, and given my baggage, I don't want to blow it, if I can help it. What she believes and what I believe are not always the same thing. So I do push, even bully her. That's not what she needs. She should have the space and time she needs to respond to God. Shirley's silences flummox me. They leave me with nothing to guide me, only gut instinct. The less she responds, the more I try. I suspect, actually I know I'm going too far, but my faith is weak and I believe I've got to get her into God's kingdom somehow. Every time Shirley is caught up in struggles, I remember the bronzed, athletic figure imprisoned in thick chains I saw in a glossy magazine. Shirley, to my mind, is in chains too. It reminds me of what 2 Corinthians 10 says about strongholds that imprison us. One thing's certain, this is a spiritual battle for Shirley's soul. Sometimes I see the chains break, some of mine too. Sometimes I see them multiply. Only very occasionally do I see them vanish. And so I sit with her in her shadows, pretty myopic myself, longing for things to change. I tried to apologize to Shirley. I really wanted to tell me how I have wronged her. Then I can do something about it, mend my ways if necessary. She never responds, which leaves me both sad and powerless. Suspecting Shirley's boundaries crops up again and again. Confronting her over something like her drinking brings me face to face with the possibility of trespassing once more. The drinking does disturb me deeply. What makes it worse is that I really don't know how bad it is. I wish I could see for myself, but in some ways I don't want to know. I visit only extremely fleetingly the idea that I can tell her she must stop. But that would be a parent-to-child response, not the adult-to-adult -adult relationship I'm trying so hard to cultivate. And I don't want her to stop confiding in me. I have to be there for her and safe for her. She must have someone as some sort of anchor. So much of the time, I can't be me. I'm determined to encourage her and I write, you amaze me with the courage you've shown. You always enchant me with your integrity. I see it as pure gold. When Shirley sounds in a good place, I'm relieved. 
It's hard to put into words how wonderful those rare moments are. When I hear a positive, happy note in her voice, I can't afford to let my patience run out ever. At times I feel resentful, hurt, exasperated, but I can't ever say so. It's such a long journey, and so little ever changes or improves. Hey, you, Shirley once said, I'm sorry I'm always dumping on you. Well, actually, I reply, I would like to enjoy your other side too, you know. Sorry, Mum, I know it's not fair on you, she sighs, and we share the regret. Shirley's self-confidence slips seriously low much of the time. Because I believe in the power of making choices, I encourage her to make her own. What rattles me are the decisions I think are less than wise, like selling her house to finance holidays. I've pleaded with her not to sell the goose that lays the golden egg. When she sells it anyway, I say nothing, but I'm really not happy. Now we share Shirley's thoughts. Down at ye old leathern bottle, everyone orders battered card, chips and mushy peas. Glasses clink. Nick, Joe, Katie and Shirley haven't been together for a long time, and there are lots of giggles, many of them from Shirley, and oodles of animated chatter. Somehow the conversation turns to the question of trusting God. Joe and Katie share a little. Then Shirley puts down her glass. I think that I saw God's role as a sort of companion, basically to make my life comfortable and make sure I got what I wanted. Oh, I did love him, and yes, I thought what he did at Easter was pretty cool. But it was all very lukewarm, and it wasn't meeting the desires of my heart. Like providing a parking place when you have to have one, asks Joe, or giving you a great date. Everyone laughs. Joe's just met Colin, so she has dating very much on her mind. All that and more, Shirley explains. I actually thought God was some kind of useful and supremely competent servant. And when he slips up, Nick asks, that's when I throw my toys out the cot and stomp off angry again. The arrival of the waiter on balancing plates of cod, peas and chips cuts the conversation short. Not too much later, the girls head back home and Shirley and Nick sit on the couch at Seven Sandy Lane, enjoying one last glass of wine. She opens her heart a little more. I have known about God all my life. I think I gave my life to God when I was four. I have always gone to church, but it just seemed to me that wherever I looked for love, I couldn't find it. I wasn't sure that God loved me. You know, come to think of it, my life's journey has been a search for love. I felt like I'd asked and asked for things and God hadn't really heard me. It felt like I was doing something wrong. So I had a big fight with God. After I broke up with Scott, I just said to God, I believe you there, but I don't believe you care about me, because how come you've not answered any of my prayers? Nick looks intently into her eyes. So you think that because God doesn't give you what you want, that proves he doesn't love you? He holds her gaze for quite a while. Then she looks away. Well, doesn't it? But there's more. There are other things too. As part of her journey, Shirley ponders, questions and tries to find answers. Besides copying into her diary the gems she's found in Larry Crabb's book, The Precious Off, she's underlined screeds in the book herself. She's amazed to find so much of it absolutely spot on for the probably darkest year of her whole journey so far. Very excited, she visits Nick at Ship Lake. Hey you, she says, book in hand, look here. Crab says the one thing above all else that we must have are actually encounters with Jesus Christ. I've had some, you know, and I know you have. Smiling, as he remembers, Nick dishes up the spag bowl he's made. That's where his focus lies for the moment. True, he manages to say as they twist spaghetti and scoop up sauce. Crab also says only God can satisfy the depth of our human desire. We can count on him to draw us to him through each new set of circumstances. Shirley twists spaghetti round her fork and swallows getting tomato on her chin. Nick laughs and wipes it off for her. 
So the journey we make through life is really mapped out circumstance by circumstance and how we deal with them, choice by choice. Nick's still not really listening. He points to the rapidly cooling spaghetti. Shirley gets the message. Later, she turns more pages. Crab points out that pain teaches us to value intimacy with God over blessing. It leaves us full, alive and happy. Nick's mobile buzzes. Once he sits down again, Shirley says, Crab believes the spirit advances God's route for us and we come to thirst desperately for it. He convinces us that we are fully loved. Our baggage too can be redeemed. Hence the pressure's off. How cool is that? As you know, a major part of my baggage is my struggle to believe that God really loves me. Nick shakes his head. That's such a biggie for you, Shirley. Such a biggie. Once home again, Shirley opens the book and ponders some more. There's God. That's a real biggie. Maybe he's actually hands-on in caring for me. Then maybe I actually have to factor him in. Permanently? She slips into prayer. God, I don't know how you can produce a consuming love for you in me. I seem to find so much more enjoyment in other things. It's going to take a miracle to do that. Sometime in 2011, as a trainee counsellor with Christian World Revival, Shirley has to report to her mentor, Christine. As a friend and counsellor, Chris listens intently. As a mother and grandmother, she's full of compassion. Shirley comes away really encouraged. Chris saw a picture of my heart, she writes, with a blade in it causing a deep wound. Together, we pulled out the blade and prayed for healing. Now I feel like the old familiar pain is gone. I feel light and free and happy. The other thing God did for me, which moved me deeply, was that he gave Chris an overwhelming sense of his love for me and also of his pain that I've been hurt. Chris was so overwhelmed that she cried and cried and I ended up comforting her. We were really touched by God, Mum. It was so precious. I feel better than I have in ages. I've been reading from my book, Mum, Please Help Me Die, the story of my daughter Shirley's battle with cancer. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, please contact me. You can do that at the following email address, thigh at mumplpleasehelpmedie.co.za. I hope you'll be with me again next week. Goodbye.